Even men at the top of their game find themselves wanting more from life. Whether it's more meaning, unshakable confidence, a bigger impact, more money, deeper love, a hotter sex life, or a powerful legacy. Find out how good your life can be on this episode of Man Alive. Also, as I've supported men in their love and work lives for 15 years now, many men ask for the right words to say to be more successful, attractive, and desirable. But I found it's not so simple as giving scripts or lines because every man is different. So giving words or scripts would be like giving a tall, thin man a shorter, wider man's pants or vice versa. The words have to make sense for you and your personality, and there's so much happening beneath the surface that people are responding to. If you're interested in how to become a better lover and leader in your own unique way, go to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz, or you can text ALIVE to 44144. It only takes a couple minutes, and you'll start to get an idea of how you can be both more respected and desired. After you fill it out, we can schedule a time to review your quiz and talk about your specific challenges and desires. So again, go to either shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz or text ALIVE to 44144. That's A-L-I-V-E to 44144. Enjoy this episode of Man Alive. Hello and welcome to this episode of Man Alive. I'm Shana James and I'm here today with Sean Galanos. We're going to do a joint episode. Welcome, Sean. Thank you for being here. Thank you for (laughs) being here. We both get to thank each other because we're both here on each other's shows. So your podcast is the Love Drive podcast. That's For my Man Alive folks, will you give a little intro about you know, the premise of your show and, and who you are, and then I can do that for your people. Sure. My name is Sean Galanos. I'm a love coach and I'm also the host of the Love Drive podcast, which is mm, a podcast about emotional wellness Awesome. so that we can be more connected to ourselves and to other people. It's really basically what it comes down to. I love it. And speaking of that, I didn't say that today we're actually going to talk about men's tears and how to support one of our ideas was how to hold a crying man, right? Like how to actually, but to be serious about it, how to actually support men's tears and vulnerability, because I believe there's a a crisis happening these days where um, men are not supported to be vulnerable and it's, it's not as accepted as I think it really needs to be. It's like the chicken or the egg. Will the women support the man or will the man divulge the vulnerability in the hopes of getting supported? What comes Right. And for those of, for your people who don't know me, you know, my show is Man Alive and it's really geared toward men and supporting men to have the resources and guidance around relationships, sex, emotional well-being, you know, like yours. Um, some health and finance and legacy and things like that. But often it's it's a lot about communication relationships. Um, I love that you just brought up, right? Like who's going to go first? Because a lot of women actually do listen to my podcast too. And they say how much they learn about men and that it's helping them have better relationships with men. And what I see out there often, and I don't want to, I don't want to make too much of a generalization or, you know, neg women, because I am one, but I do see a lot of resistance and anger coming toward men. And so a lot of men come to me, um, you know, last week, one of the days I was working with men, every one of my clients was terrified to express vulnerability to a woman in their life. And, you know, that says something to me that there isn't an open reception to men's vulnerability. Was that the block preventing them from opening up? Was that they didn't feel that they had a safe woman to open up to? It's a good question. Was it that they didn't have a safe woman to open up to? I mean, a lot of them have had past experiences of sharing with women and having it not go over very well, you know, either ex-wives or ex-relationships. A lot of this, I think, goes back to mothering or, you know, family, old family relationships. Um, 
there are a lot of men who come to me, I'll say, well, have you tried talking about that, right? Like there's something going on in their um, communication or intimacy or sex life. And I'll say, well, have you said that to your partner? And often they say, no, I feel, I feel too scared. I feel like she's going to be repulsed by me or she's going to leave or not be attracted to me. So some of it is experience. And then I think some of it is more just, you know, in the field, the sense of what could happen, the danger. So what could happen? I'm actually curious. Because I know That's what, what I was going to say, actually, because I'd love to hear for, you know, you as a man, and I can speak to this, the women's side of holding men's vulnerability too. But yeah, what happens for you? Or you said, actually, your partner is really supportive. Yeah, before I jump into that, I, I'm curious, let's just speculate at what is so scary about yeah. opening up. It's a question I ask my clients very often. Oh, I'm scared of doing this. Okay, well, what's so scary about that? Oh, well, and then they give me the, the answer and then it's okay, yeah. well, what's so scary about that? And if we do that game yes. long enough, it it there's like nothing so Well, usually scary. it ends up with, I'll be alone or I'll die, right? <laughs> I think those are the two where it ends up going to like the, the bottom of the well. I mean, and I think with this one, often I'll be alone actually is the root of it. Oh, my yeah. partner's going to leave me. Basically, if I express mm-hmm. vulnerability, my partner is going to say, you're weakling. I can't trust you to take care of me and this yep. family anymore. And I'm, I'm going to go yeah. find somebody better, even though yeah. we have kids together and all these other barriers to actually meet. Well, right. So that. there's the actually physically leaving, and then there's more of the emotionally leaving or sexually leaving, right? Like my partner will pull away emotionally or my partner will pull away sexually or, right, my partner won't trust me anymore. My partner will find other people more attractive. Um, You know, and you spoke to that, that sense of manliness that I'm I'm so glad, right, that that's not a dynamic in your relationship and it's not a dynamic in my relationship. My partner gets really vulnerable and cries and expresses. But I think in the common the common people, the common culture. Um, I think there's a lot of that happening. Hmm. Long pause. What are you thinking? Yeah, I just... It sounds like you don't think it's that scary I mean, or there's something that doesn't feel aligned about it. No, I just been, I've been slowing down yeah. lately, that's all. Instead of rushing mm. to say something, I try to just... Does it resonate? How like does it that. land? I, I, we could do a whole podcast of on slowing the down, of slowing yes. down in, um, in every aspect. I've been experiencing this in lovemaking; mm. it's mind blowing. But that's an, another episode for a different day. Yeah, I mean, I did an episode recently on building trust, and one of the pieces was like, okay, can you slow down and really be with someone and what they're sharing and what's happening? And I think going back to your question, right, of what is so scary, maybe that's something that we can all ask ourselves, like, is it really as scary as I think it is? And we won't know until we do it. That's the thing. And it takes some amount of courage to go and and open Mm -hmm. up and expose yourself and say, hey, I have a fear that if I share this thing with you, you're going to mm-hmm. think less of me. You're going to want to mm-hmm. be with a stronger man. You're not going to be able to know yeah. what to do with it. And th- that is preventing me from really opening up. And that is a fear that is mine. It's not yours. These aren't things that I actually yes. know are going to happen. So this feels like step one. Right? Step one is naming the fear of what happens right. when you open up. And there might even be a step 1A and 1B <laughs> or a pre-step one which is, right, to be able to get to the point where you can say that, I think it takes, uh, it takes a belief in yourself, or it takes a not listening to those voices in your head that may say, well, this would make me weak, or this wouldn't make me manly, like to, I think a lot of what I end up working with with clients is really helping them find that place of 
recognizing and believing in their own goodness with, with all their fears and desires and, you know, whatever may be there to actually realize, no, I'm, I'm good with all of this. You're worthy. That's yes. a baseline. And, and that's not a story that no. we're told. It's just not, it's just not a, a the, that should be the standard narrative. And it's not, for some reason, we, we get all sorts of funky ideas that we're unworthy, we're unlovable, we're, we're not capable, we're not, we're not yep. loving. And this is kind of a, it's a fucked up message and it really does get in the way of understanding that ultimately, deep down, as a baseline, mm-hmm. we are worthy and opening up to somebody doesn't, yep. isn't going to change that. And if that person goes, yep. ew, gross, still worthy, and also, now you have some new right. information about them. Which can be really challenging if Perhaps you're this married is- to this person and have kids with this person and that's their reaction. I can't yeah. speak to that. <laughs> I just I just can't. Um, and yeah, it's going to be really scary. And, scary, and right. can you deal right. with it? Right. Can you find the strength? And this is, I think, another thing I actually tend to work with men a lot. It's like, can you find the strength in yourself to say, hey, I actually need this. Not in a pissed off, angry, like, you know, fuck you for not giving this to me, but in a way where there's no defense, there's no needing to prove anything. It's just like, hey, if we're going to actually do this, I need to feel close to you, or I need to, I need us both to be vulnerable with each other, or right, whatever those needs are to really stand up for yourself. And I really like to steer away from Mm -hmm. I need language, because it kind of puts people like it puts them up against the wall like oh you like i need you to empty the dishwasher like well go fuck <laughs> yourself i'm not going to empty the dishwasher i'd really love if you could help me in the kitchen by mm-hmm. emptying the dishwasher i like that it would i just want to do something with yeah. you you know like i know cleaning the kitchen sucks i end up doing it most of the time i don't really mind i'd love to do it with you every now and then yeah and it's interesting cuz then i wonder okay there is a difference between the dishwasher and you actually honoring my worthiness, right? I mean, I think there are some non-negotiables in relationship and I don't know, you might call those needs, you might not, right? People have different ways of looking at that. So I'm not really attached to the language, but I think there is a sense of, wow, for me to be connected with you, for me to stay, it doesn't always have to go as far as like, for me to stay here, I'm gonna leave if this doesn't happen. But I think there is a willingness to stand up and say, you know, this, I really want this to be a part of our relationship or I need this to be a part of our relationship. I get it. I get it. And I also think that men can can really be turned off by yeah. I need language. Well, that's interesting. And not... Yeah. No, go ahead. <laughs> Which part? I was just thinking, right. So if we're talking to women about speaking to men... Right. It might be one way. And then as a man, if you hear a woman say that, and this is all personal too, right? It's not just man, woman, gender, but I'm just curious if there's a different impact. And I'm also, I I also really believe that so much of our tone and how we speak, you know, and where we're coming from trumps the words we actually use. Amen. And I don't know the answer but I'm I'm wondering if a woman would be like, ooh, he mm. needs this from me. He needs intimacy. Like, I like that. Right. <laughs> like, what you're saying is, as a man, if I tell my woman, like, I need you to be more... Uh-huh. Or, or, That's a tricky gosh, one. That doesn't, that doesn't, <laughs> I need you. <laughs> <clears throat> I need more closeness mm-hmm. in this relationship. And the way I can see doing that is by, by me opening up and mm-hmm. being more vulnerable. That was powerful. I... Uh, I think that'll go over well. I also really struggle to see a world in which that becomes the standard way that men communicate, communicate with women. Just, I just don't see it right now. I, I don't think we're there yet. Maybe I'm a pessimist. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I think we're getting closer. Um, but the, th- the thought I had too when you said that, and I actually really appreciated how you worded that, is that if a woman were to say if a woman were to have a really intense reaction to that or get ang- you know get angry or um lash out or something then 
likely that would be because she didn't feel capable or, you know, she felt threatened in some way. And like you said before, can we let that be the other person's rather than it has to mean something then about me? We're going yeah. deep. We're going deep. Uh, <laughs> and I like it. I, I'm curious. I wonder if we're putting the cart before the horse cart. I know I was just thinking of, of questions like what the benefits are of even crying with a partner or being vulnerable or emotional, but you tell me what you were thinking too. That's great. I'm going to go there. Um, My whole mission is to help people cultivate Mm -hmm. emotional intimacy so that they can be more loving and more connected to themselves and others. Right. You can only open up, to somebody to the level mm-hmm. you can open up to yourself. It's just baseline. Yes. So I think we're talking about like advanced mm-hmm. moves here, which is fine. We we have audiences that we we have an audience that is in some some people are going to be able to connect with that. Other people it's just going to be too yep. too much of a stretch. And the goal of relationships is mm-hmm. to experience closeness. I mean, that's I, I, at all levels, right? Spiritual, physical, emotional, intellectual. Am I missing something? Did you say sexual? You said physical. I said right? physical, but yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can go sexual too. So closeness in in as many ways as each yeah. of the people want, right? And for me, more closeness equals more bonded, more intimate, more... Having each other's back, trusting, things like that. Mm -hmm. More secure. um, And we can do more together. It's like the sum is more than... What is it? Is it? The 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 whole is greater than than each of its parts, maybe? (laughs) Yes. Thank you. Right? So we support each other. We want what's best for each other. Okay, that one you just said. The wanting what's best for each other feels huge to me because I think, will you tell me if I'm going off track here, but I think that oftentimes in relationship, if we feel threatened by what would be best for our partner, you know, if it seems like, well, then the partner would be growing too much and maybe leave me or... Um, there's some way that it would create a distance or something like that, that can get a really tricky one. And I think that vulnerability really, you know, in my view, usually is best for each other um, or best for ourselves. Like when we can actually be vulnerable, people end up being more relaxed and more free and more alive and more able to be loved and loving. And why wouldn't you want to support your partner to be the best right. version of themselves? I mean, I do get that I mean, it's scary. Yeah. <laughs> actually, I know the answer. <laughs> it's scary because they might, like you said, they might leave you behind and they might stretch you or force you to grow in areas that you don't want to grow. I and mean, my first, my favorite definition of love is M. Scott Peck's um, The Extension of oneself for the Spiritual Growth Ooh, of Another. Okay. I'm paraphrasing. Right. It's actually it's actually the extension of oneself for the spiritual growth of oneself mm. or another. Right. So loving yourself, there's you're all there's gonna be growth there as well. There's gonna be an extension. And so can you extend yourself to support your partner's growth? Because if your partner grows, the yeah. relationship grows. And of course, the risk is that it grows apart. But that's a risk that is present yeah. anyways. You can't do anything about that. So so let's nurture it as much as possible. And if it grows apart, it grows apart. But right. we're doing well, it for the and right And that reasons. is a premise that I think a lot of people don't have, right? If this grows apart, it grows apart. I mean, I think I have learned in my life that that's the way I like to, to set a context for a relationship is, you know, we'll do everything in our power to make this work. But if ultimately we're not, each feeling like we're growing or, you know, we're alive and well, then we could actually set each other free. Yeah. Some people want, they, they found the relationship and they're, they just yeah. want to lock it in, lock it in for life. 
Which yeah. that, you know, every yeah, relationship. Well, and there's a, I think there's a, what I've started to see as I, that's not how I've lived and I've been through divorce and, you know, that I do have some admiration for people who kind of stick with it and the growth that can happen there. I think it can cause stagnancy, but it can also cause growth. Um, I, I don't know. I was just thinking, I'm curious too about in your work, your relationship or how you work with people around their thoughts and their judgments. Cause I'm, I'm thinking about the topic of vulnerability for all of us, but especially welcoming men's vulnerability. And I grew up with a lot of these thoughts and judgments, you know, that crying would make a man weak and, and all of those things. And I actually remember when I first got married, I had all these weird things going through my head of how I was supposed to be and who I was supposed to be that really just felt like, oh, this is, these are my moms. I just absorbed them and I didn't even know it. Um, and one of the things that I've learned over the years is that I don't actually have to believe my thoughts or my judgments, right? So if a man brings me his vulnerability and I have a judgment about it, just because I have that judgment doesn't actually mean that it's real. We hold a lot of yeah. useless stories that either are no longer valid or were never mm -hmm. ours to begin with. Oh, and have just been imprinted yep. by society. And, you know, I hear a lot of women saying, yeah, I just wish my yeah, would open up. Me too. I really, I really wish I could, I could hold him in his vulnerability and his sadness. Instead, he just clams up and does whatever. So then does. I wonder what they do, right? I mean, like I said, you and I have relationships where this is already happening. So I have to go, I have to kind of rewind, right? And look at, okay, so when a woman's really wanting a man to open up and wishing he would open up, how is she inviting him to do so? Or how is she making it safe, right? How is she becoming a safe person to cry with or feel with? Or is that not happening? I don't know if we should even bother speculating. Yeah. We can talk about our own experiences mm -hmm. and hopefully model that. I like for people. that. Uh, speaking personally of yeah. my relationship, you know, she didn't do anything to say that she was safe. She didn't, let me back up. Right. She didn't it wasn't say, what she it wasn't what she said, but it was how she reacted. Right. And as we open up to people, I think it's important to recognize that we want to do it slowly over time. Otherwise it's, I, I, I call it mm -hmm. puking on my shoes. You know, don't, yep. don't do that. But if I know you and we have, intimacy and trust and respect and some time together, then the the more trust we have, the yeah. more you can open up. But that gets built by uh -huh. little tests, right? So for me, it could be sharing a story about mm -hmm. my childhood and how is that story received by my, mm -hmm. by my lover? Is it received with empathy, with holding space, with withholding judgment, withholding advice, and just... Is it received with presence mm -hmm. and love and and patience with no need to fix? Then I then I have some evidence. Oh, okay, this person handled this yep. really well. That yep. felt good. I felt I feel safe doing that. And so then then there'll be more examples of that, more stories that come up as we continue to share and get to know each other. And she continues to show up in a way that fe makes me feel good. Yeah. And then, well, then what comes up and well, then what comes up for me ahead. is what happens when those things aren't happening. Right. And how to, for me over the years, if that wasn't happening to actually not get pissed off and defensive and angry and you can't listen to me and you're not here for me and all those things. Right. One of the things I often teach women is that they're the opposite side of the coin from complaint is desire. And so if I'm actually wanting something, but I'm complaining about not having it, it usually doesn't go very well. But that I could actually, again, vulnerably say, hey, when I was telling you that story, it seemed like you were really, um, you know, assessing whether this was going to happen or that was going to happen. And 
I'm wondering if I could tell it to you again, or I'm wondering if we could, you know, practice at some point where you could just listen and listen with your heart or, you know, something like that. Listen with your heart. I, <clears throat> I know what that right. means. That one might like not go over very don't. well with a man who actually, <laughs> you know, isn't emotionally <laughs> literate. Listen, listen, man, <laughs> listen with your heart. God damn it. I did a podcast episode so on, I, I think it was called like, how the fuck do I feel my heart or something? So that was a good one <laughs> to go listen to. With, yeah. with uh, Brian yeah. Reeves. So I have a friend. I had this experience several months ago. I went to a ritual for men men and women. It was like bringing the masculine and the feminine together. And I had a very mm. powerful experience and it broke, it just broke me open. And I'm not going to go into it. Oh, because that was a it, tease. It's too long. I know. But just, uh, okay, I'll set the stage very, very briefly. I was in the middle of a circle with 30 people witnessing me have a total sadness, tear-filled mm -hmm. breakdown mm -hmm. for over 30 minutes, uh, where I was basically accessing a deep, 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 yeah. deep well of sadness. And kind of around not having gotten the love that I wanted growing up, right? And the, the major takeaway was give yourself the love mm. you wish you'd gotten, right? So give the little yeah. Sean inside who is pure and deserving and fully worthy and five years old, so how could he not be? Give that little five-year-old five, year, five year old Sean all the love you wish you had gotten and magically, adult Sean gets it right away, right? It, it, just, it just fills up. So I have the capacity to love the child inside of me, which fills me up as an adult. So it was an incredibly powerful experience and it broke me open and I cried mm -hmm. throughout the whole weekend. I had tear, my, my t-shirt was just wet and I saw everybody's sadness and it, it actually was Sounds so beautiful good. that it was. The tears and the sadness were uh -huh. light they were they had a light quality to them where it wasn't actually painful at all it was it was incredibly yeah. liberating i saw the sadness in everybody and it just welled up and so ever since this experience mm -hmm. i've been crying a lot more and i shared this experience and i'm telling you this story because i want to answer the question of what do you do when someone doesn't yeah. welcome or um, witness your sadness and your vulnerability in a way that makes mm -hmm. sense for you so after this experience i yeah. shared it with some friends and one friend in particular, I shared this experience with her and it brought her to tears, but also my vulnerability uh -huh. made her uncomfortable. And so she did what she thought was the right thing by like wanting to come closer and hold me and tell me it was going to be okay when in fact it was right. already she didn't okay. I need to tell you that. I didn't, she didn't need to tell me that. I didn't mm -hmm. need physical contact. I would have been happy with her just yep. witnessing and sitting with the discomfort because guess what? Mm -hmm. It's uncomfortable to watch people experience what we what we see mm -hmm. as negative emotions when they're not. Just, they're just exactly. emotions. Right? We we yeah, we put a judgment on them. And so I said, I said, Oh, actually, you don't have to make me feel better. Um, I already feel fine. I know there's emotion coming up, but I'd I'd be much happier if you just witnessed from you know, two feet away, we were sitting on the couch together with no need to come and make me feel any better because I'm not looking for that. And if I were, I would say, I uh -huh. can really use a hug right now because I know I can, I am a sovereign being and I can ask for what I need. Harder, easier yes, said than done. Right, because not everybody has that. I mean, I know it, it's taken me a long time and still it's hard for me sometimes to ask for what I need or want. <laughs> well, first of all, we, you have to identify what it yeah. is that you need or want yeah. before you can ask for it. So it, it's possible to get a reaction that isn't one that yes. supports you in that moment and to say, actually, that this is what mm -hmm. I would like more. If you're able to give that to me, mm -hmm. amazing, because I love you and I think you're the best and I want to feel more connected and I want to be able to share in a way that makes sense for both of us. Right, and that that is a masterful... Well, first, I just want to say I'm, I... I'm really appreciating your experience and I'm, I'm struck by how strong that feels to me, right? The courage that it can take to stand in, 
in a circle of 30 people, let alone just being with one other person and <clears throat> feeling your emotions. So um, I'm really feeling that. Um, it was, was terrifying, it? by the way. Uh, what were you <laughs> afraid of? Yeah. Well, my lover was present. So there was the the fear that, you know, she would flip out or she, she would, didn't want to, she wasn't going to mm-hmm. like what she saw. And also, I mean, how, I was going to say how scary, but the, if the question is, <laughs> what was I scared of? Um, it's just really hard yeah. to be seen having that kind of a powerful reaction. Do you have a sense of what is hard about that? Hmm. Hmm. We don't really have a lot of training in how to sh- mm-hmm. show up. I mean, what it's the, we're still talking about the same thing. Yep. How do you open up? And I guess the fear was judgment, or the fear was of looking silly yeah. or weak or not knowing how to do it. Or and guess what? The, it was such a powerful experience and made yeah. almost everybody cry. And there was women there that were saying, yes. thank you. Thank you so much for what, what, what we witnessed was. Um, yeah. Was I was just going to say healing, repairing, relieving, right. To actually. To witness a man do that to that level. It broke yeah. a lot of people open, but it's scary. It's, it, it is, it, it's, I can't pretend like it wasn't and that it's not. And, and that it might not be every time, right? I mean, I still feel fear when I get vulnerable with my partner. And I know there are ways that he feels scared when he gets vulnerable with me. And what are those fears for you all? I think it's similar. I think it's really comes down to, are you still going to love me? Are you still going to want me? Are you still going to um, see my value, which... I mean, if I put it in more common terms, right? It's like, are you still going to, are you going to think I'm, um, for me as a woman, like you think I'm going to create, you think I'm going to crazy to emotional. Um, That's kind of the opposite side of the men's one, right? Am I weak or unmanly? I think women, we can have that fear of, am I going to be seen as crazy or overly emotional? Um, And are you going to leave? What? Hmm. I like seeing emotional women. I don't know yeah. what the deal is. I, I don't know why we're scared of that. I mean, it's... Well, that's an beautiful. interesting question too. Like, why are we scared of it? I mean, is part of the fear that I'm supposed to fix it and make it go away versus, wow, like you were saying, it's it's really healing for me to just have someone sit there with me and sometimes hold me or, you know, hold my hands or whatever, or just be there and remind me that this doesn't make me ugly or bad or um, unlovable. Here's some level one language for anyone who's struggling with their partner's emotionality when they're describing something. That sounds really challenging. Yeah. Or Mm -hmm. that sounds really sad. Or that sounds really fucking Mm -hmm. crazy. I mean, not that you're crazy. Right, the, the situation, situation that, seems that crazy. Or you s- you seem really upset by this. It makes mm. sense that you feel... Oh, like I like that. that one. That one just hit my heart. It's one of my favorites. I shouldn't have... Uh, yeah, that's... <laughs> I'll give away my best stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes sense that you'd feel that way. That's a beautiful one. Yeah, I think there is a fear that that men will have to step up and fix... And oftentimes, in my experience, when women want help, they're gonna be like, yo, can you help me with this? Wait, really? In your experience, no. when a woman wants something? Yeah, like my my lover was like, hey, I'm not really great at Instagram. Can we like sit down and just like, can you show me what you do on Instagram? But uh, but if she doesn't ask me for help, I either ask her if she wants help or I don't offer. You know, well, I could have a whole thought on that, but what it also has me go back to is if we're kind of going meta or taking a step back in a relationship land or 
context for a relationship or like why are we even in this relationship in the first place and who are we here to be with and for each other I don't think most people even go there tell me more well when I'm working with men who want to have more vulnerable conversations with their partners the first step I often give them is to have a conversation about wanting more vulnerable conversations rather than to dive into a vulnerable conversation. I mean, that is a vulnerable Mm, conversation, right? But but rather than to dive into something like seriously emotional that you're not sure if your partner's going to be ready for to actually set the stage and create a context and create some agreements. Okay. So if we were going to be, well, first of all, right, I, I would like to have more vulnerable, vulnerable conversations and that whole piece. And then, okay, if we were if we were going to do this with each other, you know, how would you want me to be here for you? And how would you want me to be here for you? And actually setting that stage for the conversations to go better. I like that. And I can also imagine that if people don't know the answer to how, how do you want me to be there for you? Or how can I hold space? Yeah. How can I support you? You could also just go, all right, well, yeah. let's just give it a shot with something that's not, you know, the most devastating thing you yeah. could ever think of sharing. And let's see how like it goes. That. And let's, let's make adjustments. And let's remember, we love each other and we want to be connected. Okay, so we're in this together. I we are a that. team. This isn't, to make you feel bad or this isn't, it's not a competition. You could be the most vulnerable, you could mm-hmm. be the most loving, who can hold the better space. Can we figure this thing out together? And ultimately I want to be more connected to you. And I think that this is a, this is a way for us to do that. Yes. I've always wanted to write a book called same team marriage or same team relationship or something. Cause I think one of the issues is mm-hmm. that people can act like they're on different teams Right. And if there is that sense, like you just said, oh, we're on the same team, we're going to try to figure this out. Could we let's try an experiment and then we can debrief it, you know, and will you tell me what worked for you and what didn't work for you? And I'll tell you what worked for me and what didn't work for me in as kind of a way as we can. But (laughs) with honesty, then we can keep kind of creating or crafting this together. Hmm. Mm, I call that a proactive mm, relationship. Design. Yes, brilliant. <laughs> you know, can we build the thing that yeah. we want to build together? Let's let's look. Let's talk about specs uh-huh, and, uh-huh. and uh, for those engineers out there, what do we want to build together? I want to build a relationship in which I could be super vulnerable in which I also don't Mm -hmm. need to have all the answers in which I can be a little messy sometimes. As long as I couch that with, hey, I'm feeling Uh kind of messy right now. And this happened last night. I'll give you an example. I, Like I said earlier, had three days where I didn't sleep very well. And I had two situations where a client was unhappy with my work. And I forgot a bottle of coconut oil (laughs) at a store. and But I didn't have the receipt and they just gave me the you know, copy paste policy that without uh-huh. the receipt, there's nothing they can do. And so I was upset. I was upset. And then my lover said something and I'm referring to her as my lover because we're keeping the labels mm-hmm. smaller and growing into them rather than being like, hey, my everybody, partner. this is, you know, this, yeah. this is the love of my life, which I used to do when I was younger. I did I introduced my girlfriend to the <laughs> love of my life. And right. that's what we're not together anymore. So yeah. I'm not doing that anymore. I, she said something that that mm-hmm. bugged me a little bit. And it wasn't a trigger, but there was like a little... Rub or irritation. A little bit yeah. of friction. It just rubbed me just like a little bit. And I mm-hmm. decided to talk to her about it. And I said, look, something that you said bugged me a little bit. And I need to, I need to set the container. I need to be honest with you that I am feeling really heavy because we just got a, a, mm-hmm. a foot of snow. And I'm, and I'm not mm-hmm. ready for the seasons to change. I'm underslept. So everything yeah. bothers me more. I'm more emotionally fragile. And this thing, these two mm-hmm. fucking things happened that are, tra- that are challenging me and bringing up old stories. And then you said this thing. And so I'm, I'm 
aware that the thing that you said might not be connected for, to how yeah. I'm feeling. And I still feel that it's for important me to share this. for yeah. me to bring up. And so the, the whole setup was much longer yes. than the actual thing. And I don't really know exactly what's bothering me. And I might fuck this up. But I also trust that we can have this conversation yes. and we'll figure it out together. God, there's so many awesome so elements to that, right? I mean, because in that, you're telling her you trust her and that you trust the two of you. You're telling her that whatever your emotional reaction is may not even have something to do with her. It may, but it may not. And you're actually willing to explore it, right? There's a, there's a curiosity, there's a humility, there's a partnership in that. I'm yes, willing to be wrong. And a willingness to be wrong. And I presented the thing and and she was like, oh my God, I'm so glad you brought that up. Mm, I wasn't even aware of it. It's totally a blind, it's like a blind spot that I have. And and it brought us closer. Yeah. It brought us closer. And then she said, thank you for being true to yourself and for Aww, trusting me. I like her. <laughs> yeah, she's great. And and I have a lot to learn and I'm mm. excited to learn with you. That's incredible. So long story short, find someone who's willing to learn. Yeah. I mean, that is, right, the willingness to learn together feels so important. And I was just thinking of a conversation I was having with my partner where we were both heated. And um one of the one of the things that i found myself doing was was like i guess i would call it de-escalating in a way but um there was just some part of me that had to recognize like okay i might be wrong here and he might be wrong here and either one of us might be wrong here but am i willing am i willing to be wrong Am I willing to let him be right? And and the thing that he was saying was this way that I had not been in integrity, like that I'd been late for something we'd planned many, many times, which I really pride myself on being on time. And um, what I noticed as I stood there was like, oh, it took some humility and it it challenged my identity of myself. Like I'm a good person because... I have integrity around showing up for things and showing up for people and I don't slack off. And, and if he's, if what he's saying is true, I'm going to have to kind of digest or sit with this part of myself that I am not very proud of, you know? Mm. And then I could feel myself doing this where I was like, Ooh, you know, <laughs> having to swallow that. And, and I think there's a way um, where you said before at the beginning, like what's going to come first, the chicken or the egg is, are, are men going to actually offer up the vulnerability? Are women going to make it safe? And I love the idea in a partnership of, you know, at times each of us are going to take the, I don't know if you'd call it a burden or the heavier job of actually being more vulnerable first. Yeah, the heavy, who's like, like the heavy bag? Yeah. Who's going to take the heavy bag? And recognizing that like if I do it this time, my partner is going to be way more likely in the future to be able to do the same or to cop to something or to say like, oof, that's really hard to swallow, but I can see that I might be doing that thing that you say I'm doing. Here's a suggestion. If you're listening to this podcast, you have to take mm -hmm. the bag first. And that might suck because you're probably used to taking right. the bag first. But if you want something to change and you want more vulnerability in your relationship and you want your man to be more vulnerable or you want to show up in a way that that welcomes male vulnerability in your life, and it's worth taking the bag. It is. And, and what you just said too around if you're used to being more vulnerable or you're used to holding the heavy bag, I think it would be a good exploration to really look at, okay... I may be holding the heavy bag, but I also may be dropping the bag at times on my partner's foot. So how am I taking the bag sometimes, but then how would I say like 
breaking trust or cutting off connection at another time, right? Does that make sense? Yep, that makes sense. And sort of, yeah. Well, no, just to really be honest with ourselves that we can think, oh, well, I'm the one. And actually in this conversation I have with my partner, I was like, well, I thought in my mind before he said what he said, I was like, I'm the one who actually, you know, shows up on time and I'm the one who's committed. And, <laughs> and then as it turned out, that was like my, I, my story about myself was wrong. Hmm. Yeah, it's no one wins at the blame game. There's just no, there's no winner. Yeah. Just did a podcast with a Dr. Robert Sternberg, who uh, came up with this triangular theory of love. Every long-term relationship happy needs um, intimacy, passion, and commitment, and enough of it. And also, you have to both have the same. You have to both be clear on what Ooh, love means yeah. to you. So, same definition. And it's like the triangular. It's like the triangular theory plus. What does love mean to you? Plus, are your relation are your ex- expectations of the relationship? Ooh, wow, mm, are they um, uh, realistic? Huh. Right. So, can this relationship actually provide me what I think relationships mm. can provide? If my if my expectations are unrealistic because they've been based on Hollywood or books or whatever, then I'll never be satisfied because the relationship will always fall short. And he said this, he made this example of basically always placing your Mm, partner first. Interesting. But if both Uh people do that, then you're like fighting over each other to place the other. Right. And then you're not worried like, oh God, I'm going to be left out every time or I'm going to come last. Both people are like, yeah. Just like, no, you, no, I I choose you. I prioritize you. We're both prioritizing each other. There's an insane amount of generosity present in the relationship. And that also means assuming good intentions. Your partner wants what's best for you. That is one of my favorite. You want what's best for them. To really like assume the best and assume good intentions and then get curious if something doesn't happen that's aligned with that. Like, oh, I had this idea of you that you're this way, you know, this positive way and something didn't happen. So what's up? What happened? Versus I can't believe you, you know, I should never trust you. Yeah. Motherfucker. Motherfucker. I feel like we're just masturbating over relationships because we feel the exact same way about how to have a successful one. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) I have a question for you. How do you hold space Mm. for your crying man? Well, one of the things that actually is helpful in my relationship is that we have a practice where we set a timer and uh, it happens to come from a spiritual practice that we both share, but I'm also seeing the value of that without a spiritual practice. Like sometimes the fear for any person is, oh God, if this person starts being emotional, it could go on forever. And am I going to be here all night with a crying person? You know? So one of the things there, yes, are worse there are worse things, things but way. you know, for some people, that's not the ideal evening. <laughs> <laughs> that is the worst. That's the worst thing. Right. So one of the things we do is actually um, we we set time for some of our experiences. Um, another thing that we do at times is that one of us or so, let's say if I'm holding space for him, he will speak and cry and whatever he needs to do. And I won't actually say anything for a set amount of time. Um, mm-hmm. And part of that, what we've both found is it it helps us each stay connected with ourselves and not try to, you know, be there for someone else or be a certain way for someone else and not get interrupted with those offers of fixing or trying to make it better. Mm. So that's been really helpful. Um, and then, you know, aside from those more structural things, I think one of the things I often do is remind him that I know that this is a part of him 
and you know he's a whole human being and his emotions or whatever is going on doesn't have me view him as this is all he is or he somehow becomes smaller in my view so there is a kind of reminder of you know i love you i appreciate you i see you um and i'm holding this as a part of you not all of you i love that <laughs> and, and there's a question there i don't think we do enough no 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 and i don't think we do enough of that i don't think we celebrate mm-hmm vulnerability or whatever it is that we want more of, we should be celebrating it as much as possible. So what my lover says is, I love it when you show me the courage to be that vulnerable. It makes me, it makes it, it reminds me that I made a good Mm. choice to be with you. Yeah. Right. Really acknowledging like I feel, and something else I say is I feel closer to you which most often is the case. You know, every once in a while, there's some kind of expression that either I get scared about or something triggers me. But for the most part, it's like, oh, I feel closer to you because I know what's going on with you. And you've let me into your heart. And now my heart is opening. And, you know, we actually get to be intimate together. And often if I've felt kind of flat or a little bit distant or, you know, there's like a lull for a day or a week or something in a relationship, and he expresses something vulnerable, my heart will often open and soften toward him. And I love that. I love what your partner does, like really continuing to appreciate and acknowledge. This is what I love about you, or this is why I'm so grateful for you. It's like positive reinforcement <laughs> for dogs. She, like gives, she gives me treats every time I do it. She tells me how much she loves it and that she is just continuously yeah. amazed at my ability and it's when you get that makes you want to do it more totally this that's just that's just all there is to it so we do need to celebrate the things that we love about our partners that might not be things that often get celebrated yeah and i'm thinking about my kid and my partner at the same time right like when i look at a young child and how their expression is often, you know, the the emotion rises kind of quickly and it's big. And then it goes, if, if I hold my child and I'm there and I say, oh, that looks really hard. Some of the things you were saying before, it'll pass and then it's gone. Mm. And I think we as adults forget that. And there is a sense of, oh God, some kind of dread or is this going to take forever or, you know, (laughs) our date night is going to be ruined or something like that. But it's really powerful to allow for that wave of emotion to come through. There's this idea, you know, that we, that we need to self soothe. And I'm, I'm a 100% proponent Mm -hmm. that we do. We need to know how to self soothe. Absolutely. No doubt about it because when someone else isn't available, and oftentimes yep. they're not at the time that we really need them to be. We have to be able to yeah. depend on ourselves to to repair and to soothe and to mm-hmm. just take care of. But man, co- co-soothing is yeah. incredibly powerful. It is. Just so mm-hmm. fucking good. And we can't expect no. that all the time. But when it happens, yeah. it's gold. And being able to express something to your partner in a vulnerable way and for them to say, I hear you. I love you and I'll I'll do whatever I can yep. to make this better. It can change. Yeah. It can change your life. I was going to say like cha- it could change the mood and then it could change the, the It can goes, change your life. It, it could change. Right. I mean, that's the life. kind of support really that can. I think a lot of us didn't feel when we were young and that is a foundation of us really feeling worthy like, oh, someone actually wants to be here for me and with me. Mm. I love your little, uh, your little, put a diminutive on your practice. I love your practice. <laughs> My little practice. Of your little practice of sharing. And uh, we do something uh-huh. called heart to heart. We go, hey, let's, let's have a heart to heart. And we set a space. Usually there's a, like, you know, sheepskin or something. Sheep there's always skin. a candle. There's some time. Yeah. Nice and we soft. put it in the middle and we... Yeah. And then I have a lot of bolsters and stuff because I'm a man and my <laughs> hips are tight and 
and she's sitting flat on the ground, you know, with the yep. yogi pose with her flexible hips, feet behind her. Yeah, totally. And uh, and we light a candle and we light some Palo Santo or some Copal or whatever's around, and we um, mm-hmm. we take turns. You take turns like going we, back and we forth. don't put a timer. Yeah, we go back and forth, and we just talk about uh-huh. what's present for us. And the other person just listens. And when it's the other person's turn, it's not a it's not a yeah. time to respond. It's a time for the you listen. now to just share oh, what's present right. for you. If you're the sharer, you're the sharer. Well, yeah, the well, listener, vi- you're the listener. Yeah, exactly. Vice versa. And sometimes you will respond because it something comes up. But it's not like, okay, well, you know, when you said this, mm-hmm. it's not about that. It's not a he said, she said. It's this is what's real for me right now. These are my fears. I mean, we desires, needs, fears, boundaries, you know, all this stuff. It just comes up. And it's incredibly liberating to just get all that stuff God, out there. I love that. And I think most couples that I know don't do that. And I see for myself, and it sounds like for you, right, how much more safe and connected our relationships become as a result, you know, rather than sweeping all the stuff under the rug and kind of not talking about it, not looking at it. The safer we feel with our partners, the more we can share about Mm -hmm. what's going on. And the more we can have someone that just has our back. Right. Life is hard. Life is hard. That's why we partner up. That's why we we find community. That's why we find our tribe. Because we can't do it alone. We could. We, we it's can. Just, we can. Yeah. Some people do. It's, it's not the kind no, of life that I want. Me neither. Life is life is hard. I, I the, the older I get, the more I'm like, wow, I really get it now. <laughs> when I was in my 20s, I didn't think life was that hard. I mean, I thought it was hard in some ways, but you know, as people start dying and divorces happen and uh, just all the things, I'm like, wow, okay, life really. Shit's yeah. easy in your 20s, really. Like, I thought love was easy in my 20s. I didn't have any of the expectations, the disappointments, the hurts, the wounds, yeah. none of that stuff. It just was like, I fell in love easy and it was awesome. And I probably right. loved people really poorly and I didn't care because I didn't know right. any better. And maybe that's part of this. It's like, okay, how do we, as we get older, really, you know, learn to be generous and hold each other's hearts in this way and care for each other with all the the baggage and with everything we've gone through, right? It takes a little more than it did when we were younger, but I'm finding it's worth it. Hell yeah, it's worth it. Yeah. And more more than that, we're and worth it. We are worth it. That's a good that's a good note to end on. <laughs> we're worth it. We really are. We're worth we're worth the kind of relationship that yeah. really supports us and supports yeah. our growth. Right, which goes back to something I was saying before, like to be able to stand up and say, not a threat, I'm leaving if this doesn't happen, but I really want this in a relationship. You know, I really want to be close to you. I really want to have, um, to be able to share things and have us listen and be here for each other, right? That we are worth that, to know that we're worth what we really want. I mean, and that comes down to boundaries Mm -hmm. at some point. Right. If if it's what you really need in order to feel safe and to feel closer and that you don't see the relationship moving forward without this, then that's when you need to set boundaries. And that's also unfortunately when you need to perhaps start looking at the relationship objectively. Is this relationship going to yes. meet my needs? Right. So l- let's l- let's go back to the f- to the beginning where, yeah, some sometimes you do need more closeness in in order to feel good about the relationship yeah. and to continue. And Part one, finding the language that's non-threatening and that's based in mm-hmm. self, right? This is what I would like for us in terms of, of yeah. more connection. And if that's not something you're willing to do, that's okay. I don't want you to do anything that right. you're not willing to do. And that means that I might yeah. start pulling away because this is ultimately what I want out of life. And we should what all we be want. getting what mm-hmm. we want out of life or at least moving towards it. And yeah, it's hard if you have kids and you're married and and you've got joint finances. It's hard, and it's and it's people have been divorcing for yeah decades. There, there's a whole business around it. You can divorce, you can leave your partner, 
You can. You really can. You can, if that's what it takes to actually feel your own truth or your own aliveness. And I love the idea of trying some of these things first so that, you know, if you haven't tried any of these things, right, then there's a lot that could happen. Well, the thing is that you can want to try things and things <laughs> in the face. But if your partner's not into it, yeah, your partner's not into it. It takes that's two true. to repair. I often see, so, though, that when someone recognizes, okay, I'm going to hold the heavy bag, but I also have to look at how I've been throwing the heavy bag around and whacking my partner with it, right? That things can change. But I agree. Sometimes it gets to the point where, all right, we've got to call it. This isn't working. But try everything first. Try everything else first. Try, try. All right. I don't know how to mm. end this really because neither one of us is in charge. You know what I mean? Oh, how do you usually end your podcast? We'll do both. I usually end by having the person on the podcast share, you know, what what do you want to leave people with? Or if we if we ended this without you saying it, what would you regret not saying? <sighs> Mm. Uh, the emotional landscape is very complex and what we think might be happening might not really be happening what we think might be bothering us might actually be connected to an old story and it's worth examining as much as we can and it's worth slowing down and being really curious about what's going on inside and how is this affecting me how is it affecting my relationship how is it affecting my partnership and what is the kindest thing that I can do to myself? Mm, right now? I like that. Thank you. And you're welcome. And how do you usually end? Before I ask you, <laughs> well, before I do that, I, I want to ask you where can people yes. find you? My website is shanajamescoaching.com, and Shana is S H A N A. And most of that website is for men. Uh, but if you do slash woman, then if you're a woman, oh, if you're, if you're a woman, you'll find, if you're a woman, you'll find some resources for women too. Okay. And you, where can they find you? Thelovedrive.com and on Instagram at the love drive. I give free love advice every Friday awesome. in my stories. And my podcast is called The Love Drive. Great. Or Google The Love Drive. My essay It is. Really wow. Strong. Awesome. <laughs> so what does love mean to you? Ooh. Okay. Way to end it on a big question. Uh, what does love mean to me? Well, I don't have a specific kind of go-to thing love means to me. But in this moment, what's coming up is caring for people. Um, yeah. Being generous with my care, which doesn't have to mean I'm always, you know, only listening or always only being sweet or whatever, but maybe there's something around uh, wanting the best for someone, you know, caring that that person actually has the best life they want, the love they want, the intimacy they want, the connection, right? Wanting all of that for someone as much or more as they would want it for themselves. Nice callback. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's no wrong answer. No, I know. I don't, I don't have it that there's a wrong answer, but that's what's there for me in the moment. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thank you. <laughs> 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 that was, that really was fun. fun. I'm so glad you joined us for today's episode of Man Alive. I hope you enjoyed our conversation and it gave you something to consider and explore in your life. If you like what you heard, I'd be so grateful for you to subscribe and write a quick review that helps men like you find us. And again, head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz or text the word alive, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144 to get a sense of how you can become a better lover and leader. You'll start to see how you can be both more respected and desired in your unique and genuine way. If you don't feel as confident or as excited about life or love as you'd like to be, this quiz is a really great starting point 
and will guide you toward a more passionate love life and a more inspiring and successful career. So again, text ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144, or head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz. Join us each week for a new episode of Man Alive.